we'll come back together. I hear some great ideas being shared in the in-person audience, and there are also some ideas being shared in the chat, um, mentions of mid-semester course evaluation, constant anonymous feedback surveys, various points, um, even informal things like listening in on small group discussions, um, using the classwork as a form of student feedback, uh, especially if you're asking students to write reflections on their experience in the course, occasionally using poll everywhere, canvas prompts, informal discussions. So it seems like a big mix of things that we're trying both formal and informal, um, both on potentially student ideas about course content, but also student feelings about the course as well. So we'll definitely expand upon all of that and build on that today and what we discuss. So our session learning outcomes are that by the end of the session, you'll be able to explain the value of partnering with students to enhance equity and belonging in a variety of teaching and learning contexts. So within classroom, but also in other spaces, identify various approaches to co-creation through partnership. And we'll define what we mean by co-creation a little bit later and plan at least one way you will partner with students and incorporate student voice and perspective this semester. So to get to those learning outcomes, what our agenda will be today, we'll, um, well, we've already accomplished the warm-up and outcomes. We'll talk a little bit about student feedback, why it's important, um, what we mean by feedback, um, help you decide on and plan your student feedback approach, and then talk about co-creation. What is it? Why would we do it? And how do we do it? And then give us some time to think about some of the challenges to this and solutions before we wrap up and close with a reflection. So to kind of set the foundation for feedback, why it's important, what feedback is, um, I shared this quote from one of our student partners and we'll be quoting our CTRL student partners throughout the session today um, from Kamaya, checking in with students to provide them feedback on how they're doing in the class and asking for feedback on teaching are both important but are two different things. And we need to think about how they go together. Um, so, Kamaya, what Kamaya is talking about is actually something I explored um, in depth through some of my dissertation research, this idea of a formative assessment loop that through teaching and learning, there's feedback on the teaching process and the learning process between instructor and student. So instructors are constantly giving feedback on the learning implicitly by giving um, you know, grades um, and comments on student work or explicitly, um, and then Ideally, students are applying that feedback to improve their learning. So we are constantly giving students a sense of how they're doing in the course through the ways we're interacting with them, the comments we're making, written and oral, and so on. Um, but then there's also opportunities for us to receive feedback from students, right? So students can give us feedback on our teaching. When we say implicit feedback on our teaching, we're thinking about um, just through the you know, the facial expressions they're making while you're going over content through the way they're interacting with your content, um, what they're saying and doing in the course uh, versus explicit. If you're asking them explicitly, how are things going in the course or what's working well for you in the course? What's not working well for you in the course? A lot of you mentioning these um, feedback surveys you might be doing. That's a more explicit way to get feedback on your teaching that you're ideally applying to improve your teaching. So throughout the presentation today, we'll just keep in mind this formative assessment loop that we are always learning from our students, our students are always learning from us, and we're all receiving and giving feedback um, reciprocally. All right, so now I'm going to pass it to Aya to talk more about feedback and how we can normalize gathering and implementing student feedback. So this is another student partner's quote. This quote highlights a crucial aspect of teaching, which is flexibility. So it says, some professors might gain their mind that once syllabus week is done, the class is set, but it's never too late to change. So as this student points out, um, once, uh, oftentimes once syllabus week is over, there's a sense that the course is set in stone, but that's it's never too late to make changes. And you want to remain open to adjustments and listen to your students throughout the semester to create a more adaptive and effective learning environment. So as instructors committed to fostering an inclusive and dynamic um, learning environment, it's essential to communicate the importance of student feedback and our dedication to co-creation from the right from the start of the course. So including a clear statement um, in your syllabus that emphasizes the, the commitment um, sets the tone for a collaborative classroom experience. 
And beyond just stating it, we need to be more intentional about providing multiple avenues for students to share their thoughts and suggestions throughout the semester. So this ensurance that feedback is not just welcomed, but actively sought out and acted upon. And on the next slide, we'll, we'll explore some specific methods that can be used to gather feedback, allowing you to continuously improve the course. So to truly integrate student feedback into your um, teaching practice, it's important to make it a regular part of the classroom routine. And by doing so, we signal to students that their voice is valued and that their input can shape the learning experience. So there are several and sim simple um, and effective ways to do this. So we have informal check-ins. Um, they can help you gauge how students are feeling about the course in real time. We also have my favorite end of class random reflections, also known as exit tickets which provide a quick way for students to share their thoughts on the day's lesson. We also have anonymous polls, surveys, whether it's through Canvas, Google Forms, Qualtrics, they all offer another avenue for candid feedback. And um, really important, when introducing new assignments, you really wanna create a space for questions, comments, and clarifications. Um, not only does this ensure that students fully understand expectations, but they feel um, comfortable enough um, to share their concerns um, and additionally, we have facilitating regular feedback discussions. So you can host um, biweekly sessions, which not only um, provides deeper insights into how the course is progressing, but there's also adjustments that can be made. So incorporating all these practices not only helps us stay connected to our students' needs, but also reinforces that the collaborative nature of the learning process is ongoing. Um, here we have gathering meaningful feedback from students. So gathering meaningful feedback from students requires thoughtful questions that address both the quantitative and qualitative. So for the scales, um, scale, scale questions, um, there's a snapshot basically of the qualitative as or the quantitative aspect of um, surveying that you can gauge to students. Um, these questions allow you to identify trends and make data-driven adjustments. There's also um, qualitative aspect, which is the more open-ended questions. These um, give students the opportunity to share more detailed feedback. And by asking whether assignments line with the course material, what they would like to see more of or less of, or if they're struggling with any aspect of the course. So using a mix of um, both qualitative and quantitative mixed-based questions will help you gather a well-rounded understanding of your students' experiences. And this also makes it easier to implement changes to enhance their learning. So questions to ask for feedback. Um, when, we actively, um, when we actively seek student feedback, we not only build trust, but we also show that we value their um, perspective and experience. And we're also just showing genuine care. Um, so by fostering an open dialogue, we can identify um, and correct miscommunications early on, which prevents like small issues from becoming even more larger obstacles later in the course. Um, this approach not only benefits the students, but also allows us as instructors to refine our teaching methods in real time. So yeah, you wanna incorporate regular opportunities for students to share their thoughts, and that encourages a collaborative atmosphere where everyone feels invested in the success of the class. So you're not just the instructor filling the students who are buckets with information, it's more of a partnership between you and the student. Um, before I continue, I'm going to pause for any questions. Yes, Shed. What are your thoughts about that timeline and how you do to like, uh, incorporate feedback after the collective? That's a really good question. So I would, I would wait until, um, Make sure every you have everybody's feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe a week or a week and a half after, because you don't want to like have too much time, but you also don't want to give like little time to like and have like a not well thought out like response to the students. So um, it could also be dependent on um, how you structure assignments. So it can be before um, assignment number two, and like let's say you're in the first week of class. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Oh, the, someone asked to repeat the question. Um, would you repeat it again? Yeah, the question well, was, like, they won't be able to how you could uh, instructors, like, integrate and address. 
So the question was um, about the timeline of integrating feedback. So assessing about like what is the appropriate timing you should get the feedback to students. And we said about a week and a, or a week and a half. So it really depends on how you structure assignments. It could be even, um, thank you, Nabila. It can also be um, like a week before an assignment or a couple of days before an assignment. Yes. So you can. The, the question was. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the question was an example of an exit ticket. So let's say um, for today's class, you're going over the reading that you read for homework. And um, like, let, like students had lots of great uh, examples and suggestions and whatnot. Um, exit ticket could be, do you still have any more questions about the reading? It could be. Um, <laughs> I think it. Yeah, a common one I'll use is like, what's something new you learned today and what's something that you're still um, struggling with or have questions about um, or what other questions do you have that you want to explore next class? Um, so that's a really generic one or it could be very specific based on that day. So like what, what are three key takeaways about X topic or how are you, another great one is can, um, kind of, getting them to think about how they're going to apply the information. Mm -hmm. If say they're doing some kind of ongoing project or writing assignment, like what are you going to take from what we learned today and use in your final project? Or how are you going to apply what you learned today in this other big assignment you're doing? Um, yeah. Okay. So facilitating a feedback discussion um, is an excellent way to engage students in a meaningful dialogue about their learning experience. So to make these discussions productive, it's important to start by acknowledging what is working in the class. And by doing so, um, you're not only validating the positive aspect that's happening, but you're also encouraging students to continue contributing their thoughts. Um, and to ensure that the conversation remains focused and comprehensive, rotating discussion topics can be helpful. So for example, one session um, can focus on a course workload, the other could be about clarity and instructions, um, so just rotating the topic, um, but yeah, discussing the classroom environment is also crucial because it directly impacts um, students' comfort and engagement levels. Um, during these discussions, take the opportunity to explain the reasoning behind your course design cho choices. So you want to also tell, be transparent and tell students why you're choosing to have this assignment done or why you decided to take this route. Um, so this transparency helps students understand your approach and can lead to more informed and constructive constructive feedback. And to further enhance the process, um, consider rotating a student leader to guide discussion. So not only does this empower students to take ownership of the conversation, but it also may lead to more candid insights. So they feel like they're actually having a stake in the discussion and the classroom. Um, and throughout these discussions, emphasize that all feedback is valued and respected. So by creating a safe and supportive space for dialogue, you reinforce the idea that the student voices are integral to the success of the course. Now it's your turn to plan for feedback. So whether you prefer to discuss with your colleague or reflect individually, this is your chance to think critically about how you're gonna incorporate student feedback in your teaching this semester. So for the next, what, it's 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so for the next 15 to 20 minutes, we want you to start by thinking about what adjustments you might think you need in your teaching and reflect on past experiences or current concerns you um, need help on. So, yeah. Yeah, and for those of you who are online, we'll open an optional breakout room that you could go into and talk to people in, um, or you can feel free to just reflect on these questions on your own, um, but we'll come back together to do the second half of the presentation in about 15 minutes. So I will set that up so you should be able to um, choose to go into the room if you'd like to discuss some of these with people.
All right, we're going to come back together. So if you are online and you took a step away or you're reflecting on your own or working on something in terms of planning for your class, um, we'll come back together now. I have handed the microphone over to a group of people in the in-person audience who are gonna share some insights, what they were discussing, and then we'll continue on with the presentation. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? It sounds like, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so our group talked a little says, about, yeah. okay, good, about how we integrate feedback through the semester in different ways, but then also how we build in accountability for ourselves, like putting feedback in the schedule, uh, mm -hmm. the syllabus, or like saying, I will give you feedback by this point, or you will give me feedback on this day so that it is, like you're everyone's accountable to mm -hmm. that feedback. What else did we talk about? Uh, oh yeah, and we talked, this is more teacher like feedback for students. So not as relevant, but we talked about different methods of sharing feedback uh, with students, but that is something I think you could share with students and then encourage them to use it with you. Like mm. you model for them how to give feedback so that they can give you better feedback too. Mm -hmm. Like it's possible to compassionately give constructive feedback. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so one of our instructors is uh, uh, um, doing async, teaching async. And we talked about building checkpoints in to like connect with students and like actually get like forge uh, some sort of, like connection with them in spite of the asynchronous setup. So like, is mm -hmm. that a way to also solicit feedback from students during those like short meetings? Lots of great ideas there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I love the focus on accountability and structure. If we say we're gonna do it, um, we put it on the syllabus, then it'll happen. It's way, well, it's way more likely to happen, right? And that students will see that as, um, you know, part of the course could even be worked into, the participation points for the course or something um, and include like feedback for you, but also kind of reflection on how they're doing in the class as well. Okay, awesome. So now we'll transition into this concept of co-creation related to feedback, kind of like feedback plus, right? So uh, another quote from our student partner, Kutsia, um, to transition into this segment, that professors should be open to constructive criticism and be prepared to change their practice. So asking students, how are you? And listen to the honest answers. The time they take, or they as in professors or instructors, take to connect with students and ask for feedback leads to much deeper learning. So really, Kutsi is just highlighting here the um, power behind what we've been discussing and that students really do appreciate it. So the second, of segment here, um, we'd like to talk with you about co-creating our teaching and learning environments. What does this word co-creation mean? Um, and how do we move towards co-creation? So um, we put together this kind of overarching spectrum of how you might, how students might be positioned in a course based on how, you know, what we are asking of them or what we are communicating is the norm in our courses. So a very traditional classroom model might be student as receiver, where they're passively receiving instruction. They are being talked at or lectured at, asked to do certain things. Um, moving towards a more interactive approach, student as informer, where you're doing those mid-semester feedback surveys, you're reading those SETs, you are asking for students to fill out exit tickets, where students are providing feedback and suggestions for changes, and then you as the instructor are applying those changes. And that is what we've been talking about for the beginning of this section. And that is awesome to be doing, but we'll encourage you to think of even beyond that. And what does it look like to position students as co-creators where they're not just providing feedback and suggestions, but they're working with you to apply those feedback and suggestions um, where they're an active partner in the learning experience. So um, maybe you're, you're asking what needs to change and then you're working together to make that change. So what is co-creation? The goal of co-creation is to achieve a deeper understanding of teaching and learning through shared analysis and revision. So everyone, student and students and teacher are responsible for the improvement of the course. 
um, based on respect, reciprocity, and shared responsibility between students and faculty. So those are the principles coming from these authors down the bottom right, Co Cook, Sather, Goville, and Felton. Um, and it includes making collaborative and transparent decisions about changing our practices in some instances and not in others. Um, so there might be certain things where you need to make the call. You are the expert. You are the one making the decisions about what is best for student learning. Not everything needs to be co-created, and that's not what we're suggesting here, but thinking about moments and times where it is appropriate and it is possible um, and it would help improve the learning experience. So um, we're developing mutual respect for the individual and the shared rationales behind our choices. So benefits there, as you could imagine, that lots of benefits and research indicates that co-creation leads to greater engagement. So students are more motivated um, and more involved in their learning. Increased awareness. So students are more aware of uh, the learning process, the why behind certain things they're doing in the course, um, how it's helping them as learners, creating that stronger sense of identity and even connection to your discipline or your field, and improved teaching and classroom experience. So even if this might be new for instructors, at first it might seem uh, uncomfortable in some ways that over time it improves your experience, makes you feel more excited about teaching when you can work with your students to develop the learning experience. So um, these benefits are kind of overlapping between students and faculty or the instructor. So uh, another student partner quote to back this up. So. Marie said, having the professor say, I want you to self-advocate and I want you to come to me if something isn't working for you. And encouraging that kind of behavior with their students is another way to make the classroom more equitable. So students really appreciating when students, teachers are and professors are very explicit that they want students to speak up when they think something could be better or different or um, more aligned with their, their needs and preferences. Um, so what could this look like? And this is really building off of a session my colleague Shed, who is in the audience, gave earlier today about speculative pedagogy, but this idea of creating your own micro society in the classroom, um, where the classroom can exist as its own space with its own norms and its own kind of rules about how things function. And maybe rules isn't the best word, but um, its own norms and guidelines and principles and all contribute to its functioning. We're all part of a community that creates this micro society, working together to make decisions about norms, guidelines, or expectations, readings and content, potentially making decisions together about policies. Um, I know that's a little bit more challenging, or maybe there are certain policies that are up for debate and certain ones that you think are really important to maintain, um, working together to make decisions about assignments, um, or even grading structures, if you're really trying to go um, to the next level there. Um, so steps for collaborative norm setting, this, uh, we also presented in an earlier session today, but wanted to reiterate the importance of it here. If you're working with students at the beginning of the semester or, or towards the beginning of the semester on thinking about what, how do you want the classroom to be? Um, what are the norms we want to have together? Here's some steps you could follow. So giving students some prompts and on the next slide, we have some example prompts where they reflect and write their ideas and perspectives. So for example, um, you know, what can, what are some values and principles we can um, enact in this course that will make you feel included or that will support your learning? And then putting students into small groups to share their ideas with their peers, recognize common themes. Okay, all, all of us in this group agree that this needs to happen or agree that we really value collaboration, or we really value honesty and open communication. Um, and then as a whole class, asking each group to share one idea, creating a combined list, seeing where the class is in agreement or disagreement and talking through that. And then and coming up with a final list together um, for students to approve and, and see if there's any revisions or clarifications needed. So this could be something to think about doing as we go into the beginning of the semester some guiding questions for co-creation. I know Aya put some, a, there was a similar slide earlier where we had questions related to gathering feedback, but these are different questions um, related to co-creating classroom norms. And we highlighted the word we here to really show that the use of language like we, us, together with, um, goes a long way with students. So think 
wording things like what do we think class participation should look like? Uh, what can we do to make the course more accessible? What can we do to establish a more positive classroom environment and so on? Um, so great questions that you can ask for students to reflect on. Um, could even be an exit ticket question, going back to the question before, and then say at the end of the first day of class, this could be the exit ticket, and then you talk about it on the second day of class, um, just as an example. And one last thing to talk about related to co-creation. So for those of you who might be involved in other offices on campus or in program development or working with your colleagues sometimes to make decisions about curriculum, um, beyond working with the students who are in your courses, you might work with students in and out of your classes on larger projects like a course redesign. So bringing back students who have taken your course to work with you on revising and um, upgrading the course or curriculum redesign, program design, uh, even research. So there's lots of examples of this already happening on campus. Um, and a goal of mine is to bring some of these people together to talk more about it. All right. Um, all right, now I'm going to bring up a quick check-in question that can kind of serve as an opportunity for anybody to ask questions, but also think about, okay, we're giving you a lot of information, what challenges you anticipate regarding co-creation? So we'll just think about that for a minute or so. And feel um, free to share in the chat as well. For those in person, feel free to talk to your neighbors or
So we're going to wrap up some final thoughts. Okay, so we're going to have some time. Sorry to interrupt. We're going to have some time to share at a later time. So challenges and solutions. Oh, okay. So engaging core creation and feedback is challenging, especially when it involves um, disrupting traditional powers and dynamics. Um, it requires us as instructors to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So this means embracing vulnerability, actively listening to our students and building trust through guidance, reassurance and validation. Uh, navigating inst institutional structures, practices, and norms can also be a challenge. So it's important to start small and build up. It can be daunting at times, but this approach allows you to be make more meaningful adjustments without becoming overwhelmed by large um, institutional constraints. And establishing an inclusive co-creation approach is another key challenge. So we must consider whose, vo whose voices are being heard in our classrooms and whose are not. It's essential to actively seek out and amplify the perspective of those who have been traditionally marginalized. So reframing our perceptions and challenging biases will help create a more equitable and inclusive learning environment. And while these challenges are real, there's also opportunities for growth. So both for us and for our students, we wanna model that this is a learning journey and we're not always perfect. So by addressing them head on and implementing these solutions, we can foster a classroom culture that values, um, collaboration, inclusivity, and continuous improvement. Here we have another student partner's quote for more insight on how much students value being heard by their instructors. So trust, rapport, and community are all important. Students need to know they will be heard by Allie. And time for our final discussion and reflection. So, um, feel free to um, share out loud or in the chat. So what re reactions or questions do you have? How will you partner with students and incorporate the student voice and feedback this semester? So we'll give you about like, okay. So I guess share out your thoughts for now. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, we have a question. So something we talked about in our group was setting norms with students. And I raised the uh, concern, and I've had this struggle for a few semesters, is I ask students to set norms at the beginning of the semester and give them like prompts and guide the activity, but they often don't really know what to say. And I think especially as many are starting college with that class, and have never been asked for their input on how to engage with each other. Um, I So they always come up with great ideas, but I notice that when I say, okay, what does it mean to be respectful? They, they don't quite know what to say and it's very quiet. So I'm wondering what folks think of how to address that. Before I answer, does anybody wanna provide some insight? Chat, nobody in chat, okay. so. I would try to provide examples from previous years. Um, so see what was working with your past students and try to bring it up with your current students. And if you are starting afresh, I guess you can provide examples yourself as the instructor to how um, that
that would look like and then guide them to what that could like be narrowed down into their own class, if that makes sense. Yes. Hi, everyone who's on Zoom. My name is Alyssa Best. I'm a career advisor and adjunct instructor in the Career Center. I have a question, but let me give a little context. But the, the question is related to, um, get, I wanted to get your, your feedback on, I wanted to co-create and uh, get your, your and, and solicit um, people's opinion on the when to have assignments due, because I've kind of gone through an evolution of this. So initially when I um, kind of inherited the class from a, a former career center director who had designed the course, uh, this is a career exploration development course. Then this is, this is a live class that meet that um, a one credit class that meets once a week. And she had the assignment to do, I think the day before, like we, you know, like on, we met on a Wednesday, for example, mm -hmm. Tuesday at 1159 mm -hmm. PM midnight, essentially. And so I kind of just copy and pasted that style for a while. Now, granted, I wasn't up at midnight to review the work, but, um, then I think it was a, like, it was a CTRL workshop, I believe that suggested not making it that, the, you know, the deadlines at midnight, because for students who procrastinate or, you know, work to the deadline oriented, or now we, you know, have more, have a better understanding of neurodivergencies and, you know, and like, who, you know, folks who maybe just be more prone to that, it, it can kind of, you know, inadvertently sort of force students to stay up late, you know, and work, you know, because a lot of times I would see students submitting work at 1am, 2am, who would be, you know, they would miss the, the, the deadline would get them going at say, 10 p.m., but they wouldn't complete the work yeah. until one or two. So anyway, I've been teaching this past semester at two, uh, past few semesters at uh, at 2.30 uh, p.m. on a Wednesday. I changed the time, initially I changed it to 12 p.m., like in the, you know, the middle of noon. Then I changed it to, then after a semester two, I, I think students, it was like too much of a gap of time with students. They were like, oh, and so then I changed it to 2 p.m. with the thought of, give you that way. I don't want you like rushed. I didn't want to use the, the class time as the deadline. Um, because, and this would be due the day of the class, not the day before. Um, anyway, fast forward co-creating. I got, I received feedback from my student. I was offering my students an extension on assignment this past spring. And so my students said, um, and I'm glad that people felt empowered to speak up and that that's indicated I had given them that space to, you know, yeah. to build that rapport. And some said a lot of our, like, we're, 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 you know, we're used to having assignments due at midnight. Can we make the assignment due at midnight? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, sure. If you want to do that, that's great. You know, like if you want, I can make it due at midnight. Granted, you know, it's like I said, and I even gave, gave them a little bit of my thought process into why I said, you know, what, what I just explained. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know what, with all that said, what do I do with that deadline? <laughs> <laughs> so you can do two things one you can try scaffolding the assignments so like they don't feel like they're pressured to work until the last minute for one big paper you can just break it down into smaller chunks so they know like okay I have this like one page like I don't know bibliography or um, one page like summary of this like um, article that will hand in by this time so it's like low stakes and not like something that's like that they're more afraid of like turning in and that's probably why they're holding it off um another thing I'm trying to remember what it was I forgot my other thing <laughs> my other answer um but yeah definitely like breaking down like um, assignments into, into chunks and you can also send out a survey just to see what times are available um yeah so definitely yeah yeah so like what time do you um this could be at the beginning of the semester or even before the assignment is due where you're just like asking them um there's this important assignment coming up i want to gauge what time you're you you're free and what time like you're usually working so i can like set a deadline and like hopefully when responses come in you can um then like formulate an actual like deadline that they will follow Yes. Mike. 
Um, yeah. uh, another thing, I really love that survey idea that Aya just shared. Another thing could be if you have kind of a split among student, like what times they pick, mm -hmm. you might offer two different deadlines, um, which sounds kind of weird, but some students really like, they're like, I want to get it out of the way. Yeah. I want to do it now. And then some students like having more time. So that's that, you know, you, it's okay if they don't reach a consensus, I guess, with, with the deadline. Just to, I guess what I've done that's similar to what she had just said is going along with the idea of, I don't want to make it at midnight because I don't want you staying up. I've set deadlines for like 5 PM, for example, but said, you won't be penalized if you turn it in after 5 PM, as long as it's in before class. Um, so for those who see a deadline and they're like, okay, I, that's, orienting them to your goal is to finish it by 5 p.m. the day before class but there's no harm if you aren't able to get to it because all st students when being very honest will also say if you don't if you set deadlines during the day then we'll end up doing it in our other classes which we don't want them doing homework during other yeah. classes so if something's due at 2 p.m. or 5 p.m. they'll work on it in their 2 30 p.m. class which is not ideal. Also, I want to add, you can make note to like emphasize the idea that they should turn something in. Something is better than nothing. Like I've had instructors tell me like, because I've struggled with deadlines with dra big paper drafts. They would tell me just turn something in. Like even if you think it's bad, it's better than just turning nothing in and getting a zero. So, yeah. I think the same thing because um, I think and, um, <laughs> okay, I'm Doug. I'm, I'm actually an adjunct here. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of times, um, one, the one thing I really reiterate with my students um, is one word, communication. Um, if you know you're going to have to miss class for whatever reason, give me a heads up, please. If you're going to be late for whatever reason, give me a heads up, please. If you're going to be late for a particular assignment, even though I set a due date, I understand that students have a big load. There might be other things that they know they're going to be late or so. Again, just give me a heads up, please, because I think that's so critical to, to have those lines of communication open between professors and students, right? There, because it's going to be the same when you go into the workforce. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to communicate with your boss. You're going to have to communicate with coworkers. That is such a critical um, a critical skill to have right there, and I cannot emphasize that enough because – when students don't tell me why they didn't show up for class and they don't tell me why they didn't they do their assignment, I have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't tell me, I can't help you because I have no clue why you didn't show up or why you didn't do this. When you, when, when you tell me, oh, yeah, because uh, there, there, was, there was an issue with my family or there was, um, there was something with my work. Okay, now I, now I have an idea right there. I think that... Right, just, just just like I said, just 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 a few just a few basic things right there. Right? And same thing, you know, like if um, just shoot me a text. It doesn't have to be a whole life story. Just say, hey, professor. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna be able to make it to class today. I'm not I'm, I'm not feeling well, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna just stay in. That's all I need to know right there, and it takes two minutes basically. Yeah, as instructors, we're here to help you. We're not. We're, we're not the bad people. We're, we're not, not the bad, bad guy people. there. I know like I know like back in elementary school, <laughs> students see us teachers as authoritarian figures. We make their lives miserable. We have too yeah. many rules in class right there. But that's not really the case here. The idea is we want we want you to succeed right there. Yeah. Really great. That, like that's a real world thing. Mm -hmm. like, you will miss deadlines or you will get Life happens for both instructors and students. Right. And, and I tell my students this, if you are sick, um, please stay home. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you, be beforehand, I, I, before COVID came, I mean, if, if, I, if I had one leg functioning, I would still hobble to class right there. But now with COVID, that changed everything. <laughs> it's like, not that I don't want you here. I just I just don't want whatever you have. And so just, um, and plus that, right. Yeah. And plus, um, when you're sick, you should rest because that's going to help you heal better, as opposed to trying to fight it and keep keep oh, no. keep doing it, and then and then you're you're going to be in worse shape. There you go. Yeah. 
Okay, so this concludes our presentation. Um, but before we end, we want you to connect with a student partner. So um, if you want to work directly with a student partner, you can sc scan the QR code that is located in the bookmarks right over here that Hannah will pass out. We offer one-on-one -on -one meetings to discuss teaching, in-class informal observations, and input on course materials. And thank you again for joining us. Um, if you want to get in contact with Hannah and I, um, my email is am01278 at american.edu. Hannah's is h-j-a-r-d-i-n-e um, at american.edu. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for a great session. Thank you. Not like me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>